Good evening, Twitch. Welcome to episode four of Birth of a World. Tonight on the tonight on the show, we're going to be going th um, using the recently released fifth edition monster manual to populate our starting dungeon. Uh, so let's pull up that dungeon map and uh, kind of dive right in. Um, for anyone who's new to the program today, uh, this is an interactive stream, so you are invited and indeed encouraged to. Um, you're invited and encouraged to comment in the chat and uh, contribute your ideas uh, to the stream. I will also be asking the channel questions um, and feel free to answer. Uh, this is the wrong map, actually. I redid a bit of the Tin Cliff Mine, uh, the, our first starting dungeon. Uh, in particular, we now have a version that uh, has a, there we go. Oh, we now have a version that has a grid, so check that out. Um, so hex grid. Uh, this is something that is more of a personal preference of mine. Uh, I've been using hex grid in my Pathfinder campaign for the last couple years now, really, uh, and I really like the way it kind of affects combat. It's different. It um, I feel like it kind of it just it changes the way positioning works a bit. Um, forgive me, I'm drinking some water here. I was out making beer earlier. Uh, it, uh, so it changes the positioning quite a bit, obviously. Um, movement gets a bit more interesting, shall we say. Basically, each hex um, is equivalent to the D&D standard five-foot square. Um, moving between, movement between hexes uh, works mostly the same as moving between squares. Um, but what it does is it changes diagonal movement especially. That's something that always bothered me is the like square and a half diagonal movement or um, the handful of times I've played fourth edition, the the way uh, square grid and then like circular effects or boxes, I don't like any of that. Um, so instead I've switched to using hexes uh, for most of the campaigns I run. So uh, when we do dungeon maps in the future, you'll be seeing uh, hexes a whole lot. Um, the actual, the hex grid itself was generated uh, using an Inkscape plugin that I found, uh, which we can give a shout out for. Um, so I've slapped the URL, this still has my old title screen. Um, but that's the URL for the um, hex map extension. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a link in the description as well. Um, uh, speaking of my title screen, actually, I had um, C. Hillier 17, who is a very old friend of mine um, uh, on uh, DeviantArt. You should check him out. Um, he created the new title screen uh, that we were showing just at the start of the stream there and that you'll see again at the end of the stream. So um, big shout out to C. Hillier 17 on DeviantArt. Um, I'll put a link to his DeviantArt page also uh, in the credits. Um, so big thanks to him for making my sweet new title screen. So today, as promised, we're going to be using the 5th edition monster manual to populate this rather simple starting dungeon. Um, if you'll recall from our planning of the first adventure, we set up kind of our starting, our first location, um, which is going to be in the uh, Tin Cliff Mine. So it's the mine underneath the town of Tincliffe, where the miners accidentally set loose a magma rock type creature, uh, perhaps an elemental of some kind, uh, made from the rock of the mine itself. Uh, so Lost Luck's asking a question in chat. Uh, how does the grid affect monster sizes? Uh, that's a good question, actually. I can show that visually before we continue. Um, again, anyone else who's listening in on the live stream, feel free to uh, ask me questions because uh, it, um, the point I'm doing this really is to teach, to, to help people learn. So monster sizes, uh, got, okay. So monster, um, so for a medium creature, it's still gonna be occupying one square. I'm on the wrong layer here, just a second. Do, 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 give me a new layer. Okay. So a medium sized creature is gonna be one square still. A large creature occupies, instead of being a set of squares, it's now a vertex uh, connecting three hexes. Huge then naturally sizes up to again being centered on one hex and occupying seven hexes And you can kind of see where this goes from there. Like if, let's see if I can draw a colossal one with this It's gonna be something like that Occupying a whole lot of hexes um, Hex grid also affects line of sight um, more than a little bit uh, In particular you can have cases where uh, Let's see if I can draw this out quickly here do to do to do, do, do. Um, so for instance, let's look at our, t let's look at our mine here. 
uh, in a hex grid, maybe you'd have line of sight like from, or in a square grid rather, you'd have line of sight probably from here to here, we'll say. Um, whereas with a hex grid, because that one corner is blocked, that counts as, uh, in Pathfinder, we'd call it partial cover. Um, that's a good example of a situation where hex is different. It doesn't change very much, I felt. Um, the biggest thing is that effects that are circular actually do feel circular. And there's more squares around a creature, so if you are heavily based on flanking, uh, it makes flanking a bit easier to access. Um, because there's now two squares that can be definitely considered flanking. Like if I take our large example creature here, you can flank that way or that way now, um, instead of just straight through um, like you would. Um, so it changes the number of flanking squares, uh, either more or less depending on how big the creature is. Um, but by far the biggest thing behind me switching to using hex grid uh, was that I was sick of things that were circular not being uh, circular enough for my liking. So very good question, Lost Luck, and that's uh, why we have hex grid. So cutting back to where I was, uh, back over to notepad here. Um, so right underneath the mine, we have a rock lava creature, perhaps an elemental of some kind. And the townspeople are starving because they can't access the mine, which means they can't get money to feed themselves. Um, additionally, we've kind of established that there's some other kind of environmental dangers in the mine. In addition to the magma creature, uh, we've got this big pit here that the party is going to have to get over where there used to be a bridge. Um, we have two rooms that have intense heat, namely this little lava flow, um, which will have a lesser version of the boss, basically. Uh, and the room with the boss itself, which will be intensely warm. Now, obviously, we're going to be, because the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition is not out yet, uh, we're going to be ad-libbing a fair bit um, of how this, everything is going to work. Um, in particular, I'm not quite sure, in particular, I haven't really decided what level this was going to be yet, so I actually talked to my uh, players who will probably be playing this, um, possibly even live here on the stream uh, in a few weeks, uh, and they said they want to try something with uh, high-level characters. I didn't really intended this to be a high-level character's adventure. I was expecting this to be, you know, um, just starting out in 5th edition, so we probably start at, like, level 3 or level 1 even, maybe. Um, but we're going to go uh, slightly bigger stakes here, and I'm going to put this um, at around level 5, we'll say. So I took a look at the um, Monster Manual 5th edition, and they put their elementals as 5th level enemies. So we're going to go with that because we said we would do an elemental. But I'm not going to do just a straight up by the book uh, fire elemental or earth elemental like you might expect. Instead, we're going to take the stats for fire elemental and earth elemental and actually try and combine them into something that makes a convincing lava elemental or a magma elemental. And then we'll kind of try and look at it and see, okay, we think this is about right, right challenge rating or maybe it needs to be a bit lower or a bit higher. Um, probably a bit lower because when you tend to uh, monster abilities tend to have an additive effect. So if you wind up pulling abilities from both that uh, don't overlap, then you wind up with something that's stronger than a normal monster of that level, and we might have to up its uh, challenge rating by a point. So this is going to be a fifth level dungeon as our starting dungeon, fifth level. Just to remind people kind of how this flows, we worked out the flow graph in episode two or three. But basically, they're going to get lowered down by the elevator into the main area. And then they're going to have a two paths they can take, basically. A staging area, which is going to have our first challenge. And a shaft, which basically skips that challenge. Uh, one thing that giving players a choice, even if it means they bypass part of the challenge, is perfectly acceptable. And indeed, it's a good way to help the players feel like they're in control of the adventure. If you have this straight, straight through cave kind of linear progression thing, it will very quickly turn your players off your adventure because now you feel like you're railroading them. There's only really one way forward. Uh, they might just want to leave, and that is bad. So in both places, uh, we have two paths that join up, and in the lower level, we again have two paths that join up and have different challenges. And if they want to take one path down through it and the other path back up, that's cool. Those challenges can still be there for them if they aren't completely low on health. So in the staging area, we said we were going to have a trap of some kind. Again, lacking a Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition, I'm just going to have to come up with something. Uh, let's, um, I have the wrong window up. Silly me. Okay, sorry. So the first challenge we're going to face is going to be a trap here in the uh, staging room, uh, followed by a, the first elemental enemy we're going to fight, which is kind of going to be a cooled-off rock elemental, probably 
going to just use the standard Earth Elemental for here, maybe give it a bit of a different description uh, so that we can get the idea across from it that this thing is made of cooled magma. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's glass or something like that. And then we've got this area marked down, which is just going to be basically a shaft or pit where the players will be able to descend to the lower level. On the lower level, we'll have the loot pot for that encounter. So some lockers that contain stuff of value that they can give or give back to the townspeople in exchange for a reward or just sell it back to them if they're feeling like being dicks, uh, as some adventurers are wont to be. Uh, and then on the second level here, we've got a physical challenge, which is we have this nice little 10 foot gap here. And I might actually, when I describe this dungeon, just describe it bigger. On the map, it's 10 feet wide. Maybe it's 20 since we're dealing with characters who can handle a CR5 enemy uh, and as a result, uh, they can probably jump a 10-foot gap pretty easily. I think most adventurers can jump a 10-foot gap. So we'll probably go back and retouch this to make it a bit bigger when we actually do it on the table. But for now, uh, we have a gap that they have to get across somehow. Um, it's more intended for low-B characters. We might, re we might revisit that if we're rolling this for fifth-level for fifth level characters. In the other room, we have our intense heat room uh, with the little lava elemental. This is going to be a true magma elemental, so a version of the creature we create. Um, but we'll probably give it slightly weaker stats so that it, it doesn't, uh, so that it feels like a light version of the boss. After they've gone through two to three encounters, we give them a short breather. We give them a loot pot for the encounter they just went through here in these lockers again. And then we have a corridor, and then we have the room with the boss. And the boss is going to be probably CR7. We're going to take our CR4 creature, beef it up a bit, give it more health, more damage, better loot, make it feel like a true boss encounter. Um, so that way they can feel like they've, you know, beaten something down. And this will be a good, a good way for the players who are new to 5th edition, um, or whatever, or new to the adventure if you're not playing 5th edition. Again, this is a non-edition specific stream, but we're just, we're doing 5th edition because the Monster Manual just came out. Uh, once they've got, so they'll fight this boss and they'll feel, they'll get a chance to use all their abilities, you know, use, the, use some of their big splashy attacks maybe. Uh, to keep them, or use some big healing if they take a lot of damage and have to be kept alive. Uh, and hopefully then when they beat that enemy, go back to the town, they're heroes, they've saved the town, and that everyone feels good. So let's dive into it, shall we? Switch back over to uh, Notepad here. Pow. Okay, so we have three encounters we want to do, okay? I'm actually going to call them encounter A, B, and C. This is a we're going to have some kind of environmental hazard. Uh, just a this is going to be simple. Uh, it's just warm up, really. Then we said we were going to have the um, <clears throat> uh, cooled magma elemental which is probably just going to be a rock elemental. And I'll go over what the stats are for that. Then we said we we're going to have, I realize I'm already screwing with this here. B is a proper magma elemental, uh, which we were going to say was going to be CR5. And then we're going to encounter the boss which is going to be a big, All right, so that's going to be CR7. So now we know um, roughly what our encounters are be, going to be like. I don't like to do this. So there's another way you can do this, which is the XP budget approach, um, which is where you say, okay, the players need to gain this many experience points in this dungeon. And then you kind of pick monsters that slowly uh, use up that total that you want to have. Uh, until it's all gone, and that's how you kind of balance the encounters. I don't tend to want to do that, especially in a dungeon like this where the players can just leave if they're nearly dead. Uh, it's really not necessary, and I feel like these monsters are here, right? They weren't, this isn't a, we're not. So there's the idea of a constructed explicit dungeon, and there's the idea of a natural dungeon uh, where this is what's there, deal with it. And that's kind of what we're going for with this first adventure. These monsters aren't going to be super difficult. We don't have to really worry about holding back per se, because they're not going to be ridiculous. Um, party, I'm going to have probably five players going through this. So they're going to be slightly over. Keeping hydrated 
Yes, it's very important uh, given the extremely hot environment that they're going to be in that they can go back to the surface and rehydrate if needed. Or are you referring to me? I think McGee 48 is actually referring to me. Sorry, yes, I'm keeping hydrated because I had a uh, I had some beer before I started the stream today, and I don't want to uh, be harming my diction by being dry throated. So yes, I'm just drinking water uh, right now. I'm just drinking some water. I was at my friend's making beer before this stream. So let's talk about this magma elemental thing. Um, let me dig out the brand new. Uh, Monster Manual here, which I've conveniently already opened to the uh, Elementals page. If you have the Monster Manual with you, we're on page 124, um, comparing the pre-built Elementals as they are here. I need a bit more light. Uh, sorry, my, my computer is kind of in a dark corner. These are things you never think about until you actually try and do stuff. Okay, that's better. So the Earth Elemental, which we're going to probably use for our cooled Magma Elemental, so... So the Earth Elemental is uh, 17 armor class, 126 hit points. I noticed the number of hit points for a CR5 monster has gone up uh, in recent D&D editions. Speed 30 feet, burrow 30 feet. So let's talk about burrow. Um, so burrow for the initiated is an, the ability to basically travel through solid rock. Usually without uh, leaving behind a tunnel that can be followed through. That's important because that means that they can basically pop out of the ground anywhere and retreat into the ground if uh, they are overly threatened. So for our magma creature, we said that it kind of came out of the rock walls when it attacked the, the villagers, and maybe it's going to do the same thing here. Um, so we might want to keep the burrow ability on this guy. Um, other than that, uh, it is strong, but not particularly clever. Um, it's tough, but not particularly nimble. Um, the exact stats we're not going to worry about too much uh, until we get to actually creating our magma elemental. Um, but basically, it's good strength, good con. Um, weak, int, dex, and charisma, and just playing 10 points, so average plus zero for wisdom. Uh, it's immune to thunder, which makes sense, right? It's rock. Hello, Jennifer's friend. Um, hello, Jennifer's friend in the chat. So there is a 20 second delay. Uh, Lineart's asking, will you average the stats from two elementals for the hot ones, or pick and choose stats to make it feel more flavorful? I'm probably going to pick and choose. Uh, if you average it out, you're just going to wind up with something that's kind of meh, right? It makes sense that the Earth Elemental is strong. You know, it's very dense, very heavy. Uh, it makes sense that the Fire Elemental, if we look across the page here, is nimble, but not as nimble as the Earth Elemental is strong. Um, so it's going to be, so we're probably going to have something, I feel like Magma's not very fast. I mean, we're underground, so maybe it's a bit faster, but I think we'll probably lose some of the speed from the fire elemental and add some of the strength from the earth elemental. So you want to kind of mix it up together to get the flavor right. Um, let's focus on the earth elemental for now though, just finishing going through it. So uh, we mentioned it's very tough and as a result, it's uh, got resistance to physical damage. Uh, it's immune to poison as all elementals are immune to poison since now and forever. Um, so this thing will definitely be immune to poison. Uh, and additionally, it doesn't get tired basically. It can't be uh, petrified because it's already rock. It can't be poisoned. It can't be knocked out. Uh, going over to the fire elemental, we're going to see that also that it can't be grabbed, which makes sense because it's flaming hot. Uh, I want to say the magma elemental, probably you could be able to grab it, but it would be a very, very stupid idea to try and grab something that's made of liquid stone. So maybe not. Um, so looking at the abilities here, we have Earth Glide, um, which is uh, going to think related to the burrow ability, which is to say tunnel uh, without tunnel through natural stone without leaving a trail. I'm going to pretend that's how you spell resistance. I'm not too keen on spelling. Um, additionally, we talk about that. So the Earth Elemental has this siege monster ability, which it deals double damage to objects and structures. I don't really care about that. We're going to be fighting this underground in a cave. Um, so we're going to probably lose uh, the siege uh, so we'll drop that ability. 
So the key thing, the key aspect of the Earth Elemental, it's tough, it's strong, and it can move through solid stone. Um, it's got a slam attack that hits uh, with a plus eight to hit, and it has reach because it's large. I guess this is important to note, actually, that it's large. All the elementals are large. Um, so it's going to occupy three hexes like we were talking about. Um, and it deals bludgeoning damage. So uh, uh, so let's see, how, we, how are we going to change the standard earth elemental to uh, make it more like a magma elemental? Let's talk about the fi let's talk about fire. You'll need a lava bender on the team, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next season of Korra too. Um, let's talk about the magma creature. And then we'll figure out what what traits can pass off to the cooled magma dude um, also. So the magma elemental is going to be a fusion of earth and fire. Because that's what it is. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be um, not as strong as an earth elemental. And not as fast as a fire elemental. But as dangerous as both. Um, so the, the so let's see fire fire elemental just for comparison's sake. Less health. Um, it has higher dexterity, but uh, overall less stats, lower stats than the um, earth elemental. It's slightly smarter and slightly has higher charisma. Um, not that I think that's going to matter uh, when we're fighting it. We're, we're fighting it. We're not talking with it. Um, and it's, it's not a spell caster, so it's not going to be using the inter charisma for anything. Um, it's immune to fire, natch. Uh, it's immune, still immune to poison. Um, let's see. Actually, that's a good. Let's talk about the senses. So the earth elemental has tremor, has tremor sense, um, which I don't think we're going to transfer to the magma elemental. The earth elemental makes sense, right? It's attached to the earth. It's a big hunk of rock, walking around, smashing things. The fire elemental is more oozing around, melting things. Um, so I think we'll probably lose Tremor Sense on it. Uh, they, all have, they all have Dark Vision, which I think is fine. Um, that makes sense, right? We're going we're gonna, to... Actually, you know what? Uh, I'm going to say no to Dark Vision. Because it glows. It gives off light, so it won't be using its Dark Vision for anything. Uh, so the fire elemental, let's see, the fire can move, fire elemental can move through space as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing. And I'm using its fire form ability. Additionally, a creature that touches it or hits it with a melee attack within five feet takes uh, five or a d10 of fire damage. This is key. This is key, right? You are hitting something with a melee weapon. You are standing next to a giant walking ball of fire and hitting it with a melee weapon. It's going to hurt. You're going, you're going to get hurt. So that's... Uh, you know, you're going to have a hard time. That's cool. Um, additionally, the first time it moves into you on a turn, you take that same damage, and you catch fire. I feel like we're probably going to keep this whole ability. Um, so that's the fire form ability. I feel like we're going to keep that. Um, uh, additionally, it has water susceptibility, so weakness to water. Uh, what's the, what that was that do is um, every five feet you move in water, or for every gallon of water splashed on it, it takes one cold damage. I feel like that's a natural strategy, right? It cools and hardens. The magma elemental is going to cool and harden and take damage and get weaker. Um, so it's nice we have our nice big. As we go into the hotter and hotter parts of the dungeon, we naturally have elementals that are more and more liquid. Uh, Actually, there's an idea. What if the cooled magma elemental is actually a uh, that's been slowed? Um, so slow is a spell. Slow is a spell and a condition. It reduces the amount of the. Uh, it reduces the number of attacks it can make. It reduces the speed it moves. It reduces its reflexes, things like that. I think that's actually probably what we want to do here is take the magma elemental once we've kind of finished its stats, and then we'll say for the easy initial encounter, we have one that's been in, there is a pool of water. Uh, if we cut back to Inkscape, uh, in the room where you fight this guy, there's this pool of water here, uh, which, I'm, which a shrewd party 
uh, will probably douse on the magma elemental to damage it further. We can see maybe it had a brush with that and now it's been cooled off and it's gotten slowed. Uh, so let's say that's how, uh, that's actually what we've got here. So I like that better. So it's good. we're gonna take the magma elemental once we've settled on its stats uh, and then we're going to apply the slow effect to it. And I'll pull out um, the definition for slow if I can find it uh, so we can see what that does to its stat block. So let's do that. Um, other abilities, illumination gives off light for 30 foot radius and dim light for additional 30 feet. Yep, we already got that. This is shorthand and I can't spell worth a damn apparently. Uh, well, I, I'm trying to type here and I've got a book spread across my lap. Um, has multi-attack, so it makes two attacks with its uh, attack, which is fine. Its attack, uh, let's see, plus six to hit, has a reach of five feet, so it's not as easy, it's, so it has a harder time actually hitting you than the, than the uh, Earth Elemental Slam attack. Um, but it does an average of 10 damage, 2d6 plus three, compared to the uh, Earth Elemental's 14. We might up the damage, actually. Um, and if you are flammable, you catch on fire, which makes sense, again, because you were hit by magma. So we're probably going to keep that. So let's, let's, let's look at some actual, let's put some numbers to this thing here now. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's write our stat block here. So it's going to be a large, large, Uh, let's jump over the chat, see what people are asking about. Uh, Lost Select says it probably provides disadvantage on reflex save and gives advantage on attack rolls against it, going with 5th edition. Thank you, Lost Luck, for uh, helping me out here. There's a lot of stuff to read, and I'm also running a Pathfinder campaign, so it's not, uh, I'm not uh, perhaps the most versed person, but that's uh, part of the reason I'm kind of doing this working review, if you will, of the book. Um, I'm kind of hoping that someone from Wizards winds up watching this on YouTube later and maybe sees how they can improve picking these things up for people who aren't super familiar with everything. Because uh, I'm very much a fan of the sit down and play kind of genre and that D&D is kind of hard to get into that. So armor class, um, Earth Elemental has 17 from natural armor and the Fire Elemental has a measly 13. I'm leaning more towards the high end, but uh, again, because it's not hardened, it's not going to be quite so resistant to armor, so I'm actually I'm going to do against what I said, and I'm just going to take an in-between value. So I'm going to give it a 15 armor class. Um, hit points. So, uh, let's see here. The, both elementals have, have 12 d10, but um, so uh, we'll go with that plus, and we'll base that on the con. So I'll go back up and talk about that. Um, I'm going to give it the the Earth Elemental speed, because I feel like it's a big, heavy hunk of rock still. It's going to be slow, so. And since we said this came out of the rock walls, um, since we said this came out of the rock walls, it's definitely going to have the burrow ability. Um, uh, and we're going to give it Earth Glide, um, which I'll write the full description out for. But basically, that means it can go through natural stone. Uh, stats, strength. Uh, we are going to give. We're going to make it strong. So let's go to the high end. Let's give it the full twenty um, or plus five. Strength of the earth elemental. Likewise, I feel like it's not a living ball of fire. It is rock, so it's going to be uh, the eight or minus one modifier uh, from the earth elemental. And basically, we're going to give it most of the stats of the earth elemental. I'm going to give it a bit less con because I feel like if it's not if it's a softer material, it's not going to be as durable. So let's give it a, let's give it an 18 con again, kind of going for an in-between value here. So that's going to be a plus four modifier. Uh, int is going to be, uh, yeah, big dumb five, which is a minus three. These things are not thinking things. No, no wisdom bonus and certainly no charisma bonus. Now that we've got its stats, um, in 5th edition, the saving throws are all determined straight from the stats. Uh, line art suggests, should Burrow be faster because of its heat? Yeah, I can see that happening. Maybe it can melt through the rocks faster. So let's give it, uh, let's give it an extra 10 points of movement. Uh, and uh, that's the other thing it can do, is it can swim in magma. Uh, 
Lost Lux just pointing out uh, maybe it's Throne Magma. So yeah, we'll say Throne Magma. So that way, uh, when we reveal the boss at the end, we have that room with the big pool of lava, and we can have this thing actually rise up from it, glowing hot and dripping. Uh, and I feel like that will be a nice dramatic introduction for this boss. Um, so we've got that. Um, uh, we're going to not give it a damage vulnerability. Or, uh, yeah, it's not going to be weak to any kind of damage. Uh, we're going to say it. Let's give it resistance to, uh, yeah, all, all three kinds. So bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. Again, it's rock. You're going to hit it with basically anything. It's not going to do much. Um, so it's going to have damage resistance to that. It's going to be immune to fire. And to poison, because no elementals can be poisoned. Uh, additionally, uh, it's going to be immune to exhaustion, grapple, because it's, ro it's liquid rock, paralysis, petrification. Um, cannot be restrained. It is unrestrainable or unconscious. These are all kind of standard immunities that all elementals have. Liner suggests weakness to a diamond pickaxe. <laughs> uh, diamond pickaxe won't save you against lava, man. Um, it's not going to have dark vision because it gives off light. So there's no point. Uh, we'll give it a perception of 10, just like the other elementals have. So It's got 10 passive perception. Um, uh, language... Let us speak the fire elemental language. That would be Ingen. And let's see what else we got. We can take from this creature. Oh yeah, and of course CR is five. Um, let's talk about its abilities. So it is fire, or at least it's got a liquid hot. It is liquid hot magma, which means. Uh, let's see here. Um, we're not going to use the squeezing ability that the fire elemental has because it's still stone. It's not going to. It's going to. It could flow through a tight space, but it would take a while. So let's not bother with that one. Um, deals five, also known as one d ten. Deals one to, uh, let's change the format on this slightly. I like my under bullets better. Personal preference. Uh, so on touch or melee hit, if you're within five feet. So if you hit it with a halberd, it's, fi it's fine. But uh, Lost Lick says page 277 of PHB. Cool, I'll have to stop away and grab that when we do the cooled down one. Um, so if you're standing next to it and you hit it with a sword or something that doesn't have reach, it's going to burn you. But like things like a halberd or a poleaxe, that's okay, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, let's see here. Uh, additionally, so additionally, it can move into your space, uh, which sets you on fire. Uh, and 5D10. 5d10, yeah, right, no. 5, aka 1d10 damage to you. Uh, and I'll also look up the stats for what happens when you're on fire um, in the PHP. Uh, when I go dig that book out. Um, uh, oh, actually, here we go. Um, on fire means, for the record, it actually tells you there, which is also nice, which is 5 or 1d10. I cannot type today. So when you're on fire, you take five or a d10 damage per round. Um, and you can try and putting yourself out by stopping, dropping, and rolling and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to make this sticky fire. It's an idea. If you want to make this guy harder, maybe you could have the fire be sticky. Um, so because it's magma, right? It's liquid rock. It can stick to you and burn you through to the bone because uh, it adheres to you. 
Sorry, got to stay hydrated. Um, but uh, so that's on fire. Uh, additionally, uh, we have um, gives off light, so it's uh, bright light for 30 feet and dim light for the additional 30 feet. Um, weak to water, which is, uh, let's see here, one damage per gallon. How much get damage per gallon do you get? One. Well, it's better than nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, we're not gonna, we're gonna say that being cooled down gave it a slow effect, but uh, we will, I'm not gonna actually have it be slowed just by dousing with water because that doesn't uh, really affect the fire elemental. And I feel like create water is a really low level spell that people are gonna flock naturally to if we let them. So uh, we're not going to let it be a slowing effect just from being doused with water. Uh, although I've certainly seen that happen before. So here we are, here is our magma elemental, um, such as it is. Uh, so what can we do with this guy now? So now we're gonna look at, see what it's like when it's slowed. So let me go get the PHB and uh, see what it looks like, what slow looks like. Um, thank you, Lost Luck, for looking up the page. I'll be back in two seconds. Okay, and I'm back. Uh, so he said it was on 277. Thank you for that. Eventually I will have all this memorized, but since it's a new edition, it takes a while. So slow, um, let's see here. Speed is halved, uh, so let's see here. Half speed, um, minus two AC, minus one, minus two. Minus, uh, minus two dex saves. Uh, what else we got? Um, can't use reactions. That's a big one, because that means the players are, the players are gonna run all over this thing, which is perfectly fine. It is the first enemy encounter of this entire campaign. Let's let the players just smash it to bits and get on with their lives. Uh, we're not here to be a meat grinder. Um, on its turn, you can use either an action or a bonus action, but not both. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Regardless of the creature's abilities or magic items, it can't take more than one melee or ranged attack turn from around. It does hit you pretty hard, doesn't it, Lost Luck? All right. Um... And the rest doesn't matter because it pertains to spell casting and this thing doesn't cast spells. So there we have our magma elemental and we have the effects we can apply to it for our first encounter. Uh, so there we go, we got that. Um, in the staging room, I wanna say, uh, as far as environmental issues go, so we talked about this, um, we're just gonna have a small collapse going to deal a few d6 of bludgeoning damage, let's say, so it's going to deal 2d6 bludgeoning damage to things in the area, uh, not enough rock to bury. So this is going to be probably pretty cheap, um, a dwarf can spot it. Uh, we'll give it a passive DC of, uh... so it's a passive spot, so it's gonna be something that the dwarf will, def that a dwarf uh, with good uh, perception will definitely notice. Um... Um, so fifth level, so probably we'll make it like, passive spot 10 with stone cunning. Uh... And otherwise, 
We'll make the password spot a bit harder. We'll make it like 15 or something like that. So this is something that can be easily avoided. Um, but again, we're just we're just warming up here. We're just getting into our characters' roles a bit. So that's our first. Um, that's so. This is the enemies in our first encounter. Uh, let's just save this here. Uh, So that's our encounters for the Tin Cliff Mine. So now uh, we've got our Tin Cliff Mine populated. And actually, I want to talk uh, about something else now, um, still related to creating monsters. Uh, something I'm going to be doing is running a few sessions uh, using 5th edition, but in my other setting, in Teradahar. So if you guys, if you're here specifically to see the work on Red Potato, that's it for tonight. But we are going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about converting another kind of enemy uh, from a different campaign entirely, from a different system, uh, into um, our, into the, into, uh, I can't speak tonight, it's really terrible. Converting something from Pathfinder into fifth edition, um, so that can be used with a fifth edition adventure. So just a minute while I get stuff adjusted here. Um, ba -ba -ba. So I want this guy out, clear that out. Just a second, you guys. I have to dig out my actual design for this thing because, uh, as mentioned, I was away until just now. So, where are we? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Just pulling up the stat block for this thing. Okay, so the creatures we're talking about here are an original creature uh, from my other campaign setting, uh, my campaign, uh, campaign, a world called Terra Dahar. And I'm just going to add a picture here to show you what I'm doing. Sorry about this again. I was away. All right, you know what, forget it, because this is going to take too long, and I don't want to keep the stream waiting. Um, so, oh, we lost our, damn it. We're going to be converting a race called the Pyron. Now, the Pyron are a race of fire elemental infused humanoids, if you will. They're from one of the other demi-planes in the Terra Dahar setting. Um, uh, I'll pull up the art for them, but I just need to dig it out first. Uh, I know I'm terribly unprepared and it's a thing of absolute stupidity, but... Uh, whatever. Um, I'll just give you the description and we'll go from there. Uh, so, the py so the Pyron... Uh, these are a race of humanoids. They stand about six and a half feet tall. They have ash-colored skin, no hair. They have eyes that glow like embers. They, tend, they are an army. They tend to wear plate armor. And uh, the key thing is they are very, very heated. They're very, very warm, uh, even to the touch. Um, as a result, they... Uh, burn you if you touch them or if you're in melee with them, not unlike our fire elemental over here. Um, there's certainly a similarity to that. Uh, what I'm trying to dig up right now is the art that C. Hillier 17 did for this campaign uh, a while ago. So I can show it to you. Um, unfortunately, I am not finding it right now. So we'll deal with that and I'll show you next session. So the Pyron, um, they are tall, Tall, strong, fiery humanoids from another plane. 
in the Terra de Har setting, we have these idea of shard planes. They're demi planes, basically. Um, they came from one that's more fire aligned, and as a result, they're more fire elemental based. And let me get this Popped over. And da -da 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 -da. the stat block for this guys was on my other computer naturally, so I am just copying it over now. Um, because I haven't had to dig these guys up in a while. So let's see here. Do, 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 do. The joys of computer networks. Okay. The other thing these guys use is war mages, which I realize we don't have yet in this, in fifth edition either, but. So be it. Okay, here we go. So the Pyrran War Mage, Linart's got it for me. I'm going to link the image in the YouTube description later, um, but uh, you can pull up the link, Pirate, the link uh, Linart just made there and see, or I can pull it up. Thank you, Linart. Linart is Seahelio17. Um, he's the artist who did these. So if I switch over to Firefox now, nope, that didn't do it. The streaming software needs to die in a fire right now. Okay, there we go. So there's the Pyron. Um, basically, again, they have ash-colored skin, glowing eyes, and they heat up their armor and weapons just by being so very, very warm themselves. Um, as a result, when they hit, they burn you. When you hit them, you take fire damage. Uh, they also have a group of war mages. This is one of their soldiers, one of their foot soldiers, who are going to be the main... Uh, common enemies you're going to run into uh, in, the set, in the setting that I'm changing this for. Um, so let's cut back over to Notepad. So now you can kind of see, and naturally Notepad, uh, Notepad has screwed me again. Okay. Yeah, open stream can die in a fire right now. So those are the Pyron. These are what we're working from here. Uh, you can see over here in the stat block, we got the war mage here, but I'm interested in the con in the um, conscript and the sergeant right now. So in, these are Pathfinder stat blocks. So we see uh, if you've played 3.5, it should look a bit more familiar to you. But basically, they are uh, so they're they're extra planar fire based humanoids, and we're going to continue that. So these are still going to be a medium with the fire and extra planar description. Uh, additionally, the conscripts have three levels of fighter, which is a bit high perhaps for a conscript army, but you have to realize that these guys come from a very martial society, uh, and as a result, they have trained up um, very high. Uh, so it's going to be... And we'll be using the 5th edition Player's Handbook, obviously, to figure out what their fighter abilities are. But they have 3d10 hit die, or... Uh, that would give us an average of um, five, so that gives us 20 HP um, um, plus con, which I'll get to. Uh, they are an issue. Doesn't matter speed. Uh, they're still 30, their speed's 30 feet. Uh, it's notable that this is um, they're wearing heavy armor. They wear heavy armor so that their speed is 30 feet. Normally. Uh, the, normally their speed's actually 40 unarmored, and that's an important note. They are faster than humans. Um, so let's see, their uh, armor is going to be a half plate. Uh, and they carry a large steel shield. And they have a bit of dex, but uh, we might lose that. We'll see. Uh, so their stats. Um, Their strength, uh, let's see here. So we gave them above average strength and dexterity, strength, dexterity, and, and constitution, and then below average every other stat. And we're going to continue that, I think. We'll just basically copy this straight over, because I still like this block of stats. Uh, we might adjust it after, we play, after I've had a chance to play test it, but for an initial conversion, this should be good. Uh, so then we've got, let's see here. 
Uh, one key thing that the Pyron have as members of an NPC army, uh, they have a few features that uh, perhaps are not found on player characters, but that I've kind of created for this setting and have used on several NPC armies before, which is they have dive for cover. which is basically they can drop to the ground uh, to reroll a failed deck save. Um, this is after it's already failed. It's not like getting advantage on the deck save. It is actually, uh, they can do this once because obviously once they're on the ground, they can't get any more on the ground. Uh, but it's necessary in order to have kind of a rank and file uh, soldiers be able to stand up against a mage who might be able to hurl a fireball into a formation. Uh, this is actually something that was lifted from the complete warrior in 3.5 and I've uh, continue to use because I like it so much. Um, ditto, we've got Scatter, uh, which is a reaction five foot step. Uh, they can basically use it to quickly disperse. Uh, again, if that's an, if there's a uh, area of effect attack coming in at them. Um, so fifth edition adds reaction actions. So that's what we're gonna do. We're making a reaction five foot step. Um, Obviously, they can only do it once per round, but it does, uh, uh, and only if they're in a formation. So that's if they're standing in a block, uh, marching on you, maybe they've got their shields side by side and they're doing a phalanx kind of thing, uh, and you hurl a area attack spell into their feet, into their midst, they're going to be able to immediately spread out to avoid that. Again, this is all designed to make this army able to stand up to even like a fifth level wizard, um, if you have an army of these things. And lastly, we have shield wall. Um, which is to say, uh, again, formation only, uh, which is uh, to resist a ch resist charge. Basically, it just they stand shoulder to shoulder and they can resist combat maneuvers that way. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's pull up the fighter class description now. Sorry. Um, Someone, someone just got home. So let's pull up the fighter class description now and we'll go about actually giving these guys some stat blocks. Do, 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 do. So I got my player's handbook out here. Cleric, uh, druid, monk, monk. Oh wait, Herb to Derp, they changed on me, didn't they? You're, what you are listening to is basically a DM's first uh, real encounter uh, with 5th edition because I was waiting for stuff to come out so I could actually build a dungeon with it. So if you work at Wizards, please uh, listen closely. Okay, so Fighter. So we said they've got three levels of Fighter based on Pathfinder, and I think we're still going to go with that. Um, so let's see here. Let's make some notes here. That gives us... Uh, for fighter features, we've got uh, at third level, we have fighting style, which we will choose. We've got second wind. We've got action surge. And we've got um, specifically one use of action surge. And we've got martial archetype, which seems like an excellent place to kind of stop for the progression for our foot soldiers, basically. They choose. How they, they learn how they fight, and then they get told to go fight. Um, additionally, their proficiency bonus is plus two. Okay, so let's go through these abilities now. Uh, so fighting style. Fighting style. So we have a choice here. Archery, defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, as in like using big stuff. Uh, protection which is to say protecting others, or two-weapon fighting. Uh, in this case, these guys, they've got big armor, they've got big shields, and they want to pull, uh, you pull their targets into their rank and, feel, rank and file. They kind of, kind of a Greek soldier type feel to them a bit. Um, the other option is, du uh, so we'll probably go with defense. The other option is dueling, which is when they've got a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, they get a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. And as the picture illustrates, and as the stat block from Pathfinder shows, uh, they do uh, indeed wield long swords. Um, so we might have that. Uh, they wield a one-handed long sword. 
I suspect that we're going to go with defense for these guys because they need to be able to not get squished by player characters. So they get plus one AC when they're in armor. Um, we're going to say they're all trained that way, right? These are rank and file soldiers, so there's not going to be much variety in them. Uh, we're not going to get to the sergeant tonight, but if I were to do the sergeant, I would be more inclined to give the sergeant a different style, um, perhaps even some variation of styles so that we can have a bit of flavor here. Um, the, but the idea is these are all just lowly privates who've just been sent away from their home plant, from their home plane, sent across the, the void between worlds uh, to go fight in their war. Uh, let's go quickly over what the other abilities are. Um, so second wind is, we have is you have a limited well of stamina that you can draw on to protect yourself from harm. On your turn, you can use a bonus action to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. So that's important to know. So that's a 1d10 plus 3 heal. Uh, oh yeah, we can come up with their HP total now. So we got three levels and our con bonus is plus one. So that's going to give us a total of 23 HP, unless we decide to make them extra tough with feats. Uh, the last thing we want is Martial Archetype. Now this is another choosy one here. Um, at third level, you choose an archetype to strive to emulate in your combat styles and techniques. The choices are Champion, Battlemaster, or Eldritch Knight presented um, here in the uh, player's handbook. So let's see what we want here. So Champion is raw physical power, honed to deadly perfection. We're probably going to go with that. Um, which means they get improved critical and they can crit on a 19. That sounds totally excellent for a... Uh, for a foot soldier. So uh, let's do uh, what we're we doing here. So we got uh, champion. And that gives us improved crit. Which gives them crit on 19 to 20. Which is excellent because that's what their ability, that's what they had already in the Pathfinder version. Um, additionally, their attack bonus was probably going to be slightly lower, but I think that's fine. Let's go over to the feats now, hey, shall we? So in Pathfinder, uh, we had feats for uh, improved initiative, power attack, and we used up a feat slot for infantry maneuvers. Um, in this case, of course, uh, we don't really have feats the same way we do, as we used to. Uh, so let's go, I guess we'll have to just stop this here for now, really. Um, let's see, is there anything else I can come up with to add to these guys? Oh, you can come up with their equipment. That's important. So let's see, that's 143. Do, do, ba, do, ba, do. Yes, they really did simplify characters quite a bit uh, for 5th edition. I'm not entirely sure I like it yet. Uh, so, armor. Uh, we still have half plate. Half plate is going to give us a. Do, 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 do. Oh, we don't, they got rid of half, oh, yeah, half plate. There we go. So it's going to be medium armor now. Um, st stealth disadvantageous. And it's going to give us an armor class of 15 plus dex modifier. With a max of 2 for dex. So that's going to give us an AC then of 16, uh, which is a lot lower than it used to be uh, in Pathfinder, but that's fine. Uh, let's see here, other things we need is their shield, uh, which they just have a normal shield now. Uh, they got rid of the different shield classes, which is just a plus two. So that's gonna give us an AC of 18. Bit better, bit better now. Okay, weapons. The weapons pages. It's over here. So much page turning, I know, I know, it's terrible. Weapons, here we are, okay. Uh, so they're gonna have a, probably give them the same, the same uh, long sword we had before. So yeah, martial, so martial weapon, long sword, here we go. Uh, Longsword, which is going to be dealing 1d8 slashing. Seven, yes, because I can type. God. 
slashing. It has the versatile property. Now that's something I haven't seen before. Uh, so let me go look up what the versatile property does. Reach special throne versatile. This weapon can be used with one or two hands. The damage value in parentheses is, oh, here's the property. So since they're using a shield, they're not gonna be using weapon with two hands. Uh, so it's gonna be dealing a D8 slashing. Uh, so that basically gives us the, uh, py the Pyron stat block here for our Pyron foot soldier. Uh, next week, uh, Light Art suggesting we transfer a character from fifth to first. What? I don't think so, Line Art. <laughs> I don't think we're transferring a character from fifth to first. I don't even know what you mean by that. Um, so that's us using the uh, Monster Manual from fifth edition. Uh, next session, we're likely going to look into our second adventure, um, but probably before that, we're going to talk about go back to world building and talk about expanding the region a bit more. So uh, we can look forward to that. We can talk about regional politics the races that live around us, and we'll zoom out our map a bit more to be now a region map um, using the hex grid technique uh, that was described in my blog post like a year ago. Um, I'll put a link to that uh, in the description as well for those of you on YouTube uh, so you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Additionally, uh, I'm going to put the stat blocks and encounter lists we came up with tonight on my, on, in the pages section of my blog, so on Stone Dice blog. Uh, which will also be linked either from the channel, from the video description, uh, go take a look. Uh, Stone Dice Blog is also where I'm publishing stuff about the other campaign setting I've had for a long time, which is Terra Dahar. If you're interested in looking at a completed setting, uh, I'm publishing that piecemeal over the next several weeks. I've got lots of articles queued up. Go take a look. Uh, that's it for tonight. As always, please be sure to follow if you're watching on Twitch. Um, additionally, you can follow me on Twitter at Too Many Knives. Um, my name is in the my name is under there. All of this can be all the original content I've produced and written and drawn here can be used today under the terms of Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, which is to say you can use it basically however you want as long as you give me a credit. Uh, you can credit me as Rob Hicks or at Too Many Knives. That's fine. Please follow on Twitter at Too Many Knives. Additionally, if you're watching on YouTube, please remember to subscribe. Thank you and good night, Twitch. Have a nice rest of your day. See you next week.